I uh, hope you all can hear me. Um, so I'm going to talk about bypassing CSRF projections. So I'm, basically I'm going to talk about the double summit cooking pattern and two different ways to defeat that. And as I said, it's going to be a lightning talk and it has to go lightning fast because I have quite a lot of content. And um, I will need to be able to speak as fast as our legend of Dinis, uh, but I'm not as good as him yet, so we'll see how it goes. I'll do my best. Uh, my name is David Johansson and I work in a company called Synopsis, uh, formerly known as Digital. And I've uh, been here in London for about three years. If you hear a bit of a funny accent, that's really original. Okay, so what we're going to discuss here today is about the double summit cookie pattern. And before I explain a bit about what that is, I just want to give you a very brief, uh, simplified explanation of cross site request forgery, if anyone is familiar with that. So basically, this is a vulnerability where an attacker sends a payload uh, via a victim's browser. And the browser automatically submits. Uh, the user's identity along with that request. So for example, if a user is logged in, they may have a session cookie identifying their authenticated session, and when a request is sent from their browser to the target site, that is automatically submitted. Problem is, if the attacker supplies the payload, the attacker can now perform actions on this website on behalf of that user. So obviously that is not a good thing, and that's why we need some kind of protection against it. So a very simple CSR protection is to have what we call the double submit cookie pattern. And why this is quite popular and, um, uh, and liked by many is that it can be stateless on the server side. Because we don't need to store these tokens between requests. We can set a cookie uh, in response, and then on a further request we can verify that the token value we stored in a cookie also is contained within the request. So the thing here that this relies on is that an attacker should not be able to read this token. Uh, so they can't figure out what it is and thereby put it into their malicious request. The problem with this though is that I would say it's based on a bit of a false assumptions. And um, maybe not everyone's aware of this, but it's been known for quite a long time. And even on the OWASP page here actually, if you look at it, uh, we point out here that attacker is not able to perform such a request because they're not able to read or modify this cookie. But that's not really true, and I will explain to you why here. Uh, and also it's important to point out here that cookies are slightly different when it comes to the same origin policy. So the same things that applies normally with the same origin policy does not apply when we discuss about cookies. In terms of HTTP and HTTPS, it's a big difference because cookies are accessible over both. So not to just different origins there. So what can happen here is that an attacker can actually set a cookie. So if an attacker is able to do that, then he knows the value that the server will check against for the request payload. So if I can fixate this cookie for another user, I can then create a valid CSR payload with this specific token. And this can be done through many different ways, for example, exploiting subdomains or manually all HTTP connections. So have a look at those. We start with the first defeat, exploiting subdomains. So the first um, attack vector here could be that I own a malicious subdomain. Let's say that you own www.example.com and I have control over the subdomain, like the evil example.com. In this case, I can actually set a cookie for the parent domain. And so in this case, in, if you go to my site, you can respond here with a set cookie directive. And what's important to note here as well is that I set a specific path. So in this case, uh, we see a set for the submit path. So what will happen now is that the browser will have two cookies. It will have the original CSR cookie for the original site that was target, and it will also have my cookie that I set for the parent domain. And when the user then submits a request, if I enforce a cross site request for your payload here, is that it will send two values for the same cookie name. And if you observe here, what actually gets sent first, you'd see that it's attacker's cookie. And the reason here is because I specified a specific path, and according to the RFC, the cookie with the longest path is, uh, should be ordered first. And the server at this point in time had no way of actually figuring out which was the right cookie and which was an attacker cookie, so to say, because there's no more information sent with the cookies. So in this case, what most uh, do on the server side is they will only look at the first uh, value for a specific cookie name. So in many frameworks, you can actually force a specific cookie, and thereby I know which value I should include in my CSR payload. But you may not think, well, I'm not too worried about this, because I have control of all my subdomains, I own them all, 
I know there's no like, malicious code on them. Well, that doesn't mean that you're necessarily secure, because if you have any vulnerability in any of your <coughs> subdomains, that could also be exploited by attackers. So, for example, if you have cross scripting, uh, what an attacker could do, of course, is to include a script that would set a cookie through JavaScript. Ouch. Now you could set that for parent domain, and again, you would be vulnerable. So let's say you deploy the content security policy, for example. Very good thing. Uh, so now you may feel a little bit more confident that, yeah, I've reduced this attack circuit, because now if they include some content, they can't run this script. Well, sorry, you could actually still be vulnerable, because cookies can be set through means like meta tags. So if you can include some content, and this can't be really denied with a content security policy, that attacker can still set a new cookie for a parent to make, and again, target your site. So that was the first defeat of the double submit cookie. The second one is if you do man in the middle attacks. So here if we have an active man in the middle, we can actually overwrite cookies. So the problem here, as I said before, the same reading policy does not work the same way with cookies as other content. Because an HTTP origin can write and set cookies for an HTTPS origin. And that means that an attacker that is able to man in the middle any HTTP connection can actually overwrite or preempt a CSR cookie for your domain. And what's also interesting here is that even if you mark your cookies as secure, a non-secure origin can overwrite those. There is, however, some development here with strict secure cookie specification, recently supported in the latest version of Firefox, also coming out with the latest version of Chrome, uh, that will prevent this to some extent. So I realize that it will be difficult for you sitting further back to see this flow, but basically what happens here is that if I want to overwrite an HTTP, um, an HTTPS cookie, uh, what I can do here as an attacker is that I capture any plain text HTTP connection from the client to the server. And in that response, I inject a request to the plain text HTTP version of the target site. And then as an attacker, because I'm on the network, I can immediately pick up that request and respond back with my own um, reply, uh, response to that request. And in that, I can also then set a new cookie. So I can overwrite the previous CSR cookie, and then I can create a CSR payload and a target site. So what if we can't do this now because if strict secure cookie becomes standard across all browsers, well, then we can preempt the cookie instead. So instead of targeting a, a user that already has this cookie set, I can opportunistically inject this into any connection uh, and then try to set this before the user has gone to the site. And I can do this with a very long expiration time. So the browser will keep my cookie. So if the user then at any point later logs into the site and I can then enforce a cross address fit ordinary payload on them, they will then have my fixated uh, value in the cookie. And uh, because I know that one, I can include a corresponding value in the request, and thereby again, I can send a valid payload. So what all of this means is that there are several different ways an attacker can set this cookie, and because they know this cookie value, they can also then create a valid request, and thereby bypass this double submit cookie pattern. So what do we need here? Well, we need a couple of different additional defenses I would recommend to strengthen this. So the first one I would recommend is to use HTTP strict transport security. And that will prevent these active man and middle attacks because if you have enabled that, you instruct the browser to never make an HTTP request. And if an attacker can't force the victim's browser to make that request, well, then they can't inject cookies in HTTP responses for that region. However, it won't fix the problem with subdomains. So in order to do that, I would recommend to use uh, cookie prefixes, which is also a new standard, not supported by all browsers yet, um, but hopefully there will be more widespread support soon. And it has two different prefixes, and the one you want to use here is the host one, because that will lock this cookie to only a specific host, so it can't be set um, by another subdomain or a parent domain, for example. Um, there are some other things you can do, like signing a cookie, um, which may limit the scope of the attack, you can also bind a cookie to a specific user uh, to make them unique. Um, but also another good thing you can do is to use a header instead of a request value. So normally if you send the request value in a URL or a post, that's easy to uh, inject by an attacker. But if you send it in a request header instead, 
that's much harder because if uh, an attacker is supposed to make a proxy written request with a custom header, that's typically not allowed by the browser. It will make a pre request and check with the course policy whether that's allowed or not. And unless you have configured your course policy on the site to allow that, the attacker won't be able to do it. So let's quickly look now at the end just about Angular and how it does this. So Angular actually supports this type of pattern. So it's quite clever in that it will <coughs> automatically look for a cookie named XSR token, and then it will include a new custom header with this value. Uh, so the actual validation here it does not, is not done by Angular. Angular does not protect you automatically from consequence forgery, but it provides a mechanism to implement this, uh, and it provides all the client side code seamlessly for you, so you don't need to implement anything. What you need to do is on the server side, set this cookie, and then perform the validation. Okay, so um, problem here is if we do this with some frameworks, like CSERF uh, is an express uh, middleware that's quite popular. So we can use CSERF here and we can use that in cookie mode. So if you set CSERF in cookie mode, the mode with the secure flag and HTTP on the flag, that looks good. And then we need to specify this token here. So we do it here in the response when we load the Angular application. Uh, in this <coughs> case, again, we set it with a secure flag but we can't set the HTTP only flag because the Angular code, of course, needs to be able to read this value in order to set it into the header. What's really nice with this is that it works out of the box. You don't need to do anything more because Angular will automatically take this cookie, put it into a header, and then CSERF will automatically look for this value and you don't need to specify it because it has a default function that will look for some different um, values with name and the one set automatically by Angular is in there. So that's good. Problem is that the body and query parameters are checked first. So what does this mean? Well, although Angular actually has a very good approach here in terms of using the headers, an attacker can exploit this by first setting the cookie and then making sure that the attacker payload also has this value in the request payload because it will check for this value first instead of the headers. So the attacker can always enforce his value to be checked and thereby bypass this. So what you should do here if you're using CSERF with Angular is that you need to specify a custom value function. So if you look at this configuration here, I've specified a custom value function that only accepts this value from the request header. And by doing that, I can be sure that the value I'm checking in CSERF is actually from the header that Angular set and not part of the request that the attacker specified. Okay, so in summary here, we've seen that the double submit cookie pattern is sometimes based in this naive form on partially incorrect assumptions, uh, and that integrity protection of cookies in general are very weak, and attackers can often force cookies upon other users. And also you need to be very careful with what tokens you validate against. So even if you're using headers, make sure that your server-side component doesn't accept tokens from other uh, request parameters. And if you're using double submit cookie pattern without the headers, I would suggest you use HSTS and the uh, cookie prefixes and perhaps other mitigations in addition. Okay, thanks. Thank Any you questions? very much. Any questions, guys? I know there are a lot of tickets here. What? Hey, uh, have you seen any practical attacks uh, using those issues with uh, double submit? Could you speak of those? Um, no, I haven't looked into any actual attacks happen to, to sites that I know of have exploited specifically this. But I know that this type of issues have been known for I mean, many years, since 2008 at least. Uh, so I would be surprised if no one has used it yet. But uh, I haven't looked into specific like cases. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, my question is, is there any particular reason why you didn't list the CRLF, CRLF injection uh, among the attack techniques? Because I think it's uh, the most practical uh, technique to exploit double submit cookies. Yeah, definitely. That's also a way to set a cookie. If you have that type of HTTP header injection vulnerability in a website, uh, then you could inject um, additional headers to set a cookie for another user. Well. Uh, Header injection is not uh, needed in some cases. Uh, recently there was uh, a report on Hacker One. maybe you have seen it. Uh, there was a vulnerability in Google uh, AdWords JavaScript. 
uh, it reflected uh, refer header into cookie, so it was kind of cookie injection. And using the comma unencoded, you could uh, add your cookie uh, using this JavaScript uh, by Google that is uh, injected universally on the internet. And uh, some platforms like uh, Django were vulnerable. And uh, the guy received some bug bounty even for this. <laughs> Okay, very interesting. No, I actually missed the one, so I will definitely need to look it up, but um, that's probably one way as well to inject a cookie. Good point. How will you, and where would you look for evidence to see if this is happening on your website? Yeah, that's a good question. So, I mean, what you would need to do is, if you monitor your traffic, uh, you could look for anomalies. I mean, it depends. In this case, the attack that I showed you, I had specified my own value for this cookie. And it's quite different from from the normal ones. It's a long, like random string. I just use an A uh, to simplify it. Um, so if you see something like that, that's a bit suspicious because you, if you have a certain structure that it normally should be, you could see if it differs from that. However, an attacker, if they are aware of that, they could try to imitate that <coughs> by choosing their own random string. As long as they know it, it doesn't really matter what it is. Um, it, it's really hard because when a cookie is sent to the server, you have no way of seeing. Um, whether it was set from an HTTP origin or HTTPS origin, or whether it was set from um, like another dom uh, parent domain, for example, uh, because it doesn't include that information, you just get the, the name and the value sent to the server. Unless you're using cookie prefixes, you can get some assurance regarding that, but in normal cases, you can't. Um, what you could do in addition to this is perhaps you could try to use other things like uh, origin header or refer header. Uh, and look for other types of evidence, whether the request originated from one of your sites or from another region. That could be spoofed as well. Yeah, there is with that as well, but it's so the actual the point combination of things. This is very good, right? You cannot detect this very easily. Right? Yeah. It, can't be going, it can be going on right now, and you mm. would have no clue. So, uh, any more questions? Okay. A uh, limitation with the um, Angular JS uh, machinery with, for this stuff. Uh, is that a sort of shallow bug, or is this resist you know, a, a framework based solution? Uh, sorry, I couldn't catch the last. Could you repeat the question? So, uh, could the uh, flaw in Angular that you pointed out, could that be fixed sort of with a sort of two line change, or is there something that resists you know, throwing a framework at the problem? Uh, no, so this can be fixed quite easily. So, the problem here was not in Angular as such. Angular does a good thing by using the headers. Um, the problem here is on the server side, if you're using CSER, for example, is that if you're using it in the default configuration, uh, but using it in cookie mode, uh, it will use the default function that I showed before. Let's go back one step. Uh, here, where it tries to opportunistically find this value. So it's looking in the request body first, and the request um, URL parameters, and then it looks for some different values as a header. And the problem here is that attacker can then, of course, enforce his own value to be looked at before the real value. Uh, so the fix for this is if you go down to the fix code here is to make sure that you specify a custom function where you only look at the headers. So if you do that, even if the attacker supplies the wrong value, CSER won't look at that value, we'll use this one instead. Thank you very much, David. If you guys have any more questions, please speak to David during the break. We now have a 10 minute break, so um, enjoy more pizza and beer. Uh, yeah, we'll be in 10 minutes.